Um, so as I was putting this uh, message together, I was just trying to think about my journey, because how many of you know um, that serving the Lord, life in general, finding your identity is a journey, okay? That it is a process. And um, anybody that's lived long enough knows and understands, you know, who you are in your teens and who you are in your 20s and who you are in your 30s. Like every decade, things change about you and your identity is growing and you're growing into things of God. And so I was thinking about, you know, when I was in my 20s and I was thinking back about how my competitive I guess juices were just really rolling hard in my 20s. Can I get an amen from anybody that knows what that's like? And so in my 20s, I was playing a ton of basketball. And when I mean a ton of basketball, like a ton of basketball, like four leagues every week. I was probably gone like four or five nights a week. Wasn't good for my marriage. Wasn't good for our our son, Michael, that was real little at that time. But I was just so engrossed just in playing basketball and being on the court. And I'll never forget this one game. Um, I'm playing this guy. And uh, you ever just met somebody like instantly, like the moment you meet them, you're like, I don't like you. (laughs) Let's just be real, okay? Let's just be real. Let's be honest, okay? I I know that all of you are so holy and you don't think that way, okay, right? But as soon as I met this guy, I was like, I don't like you. And, um, and it drove my competitive nature that day. And I just had this thought, like, I'm gonna give this guy work today. I- I'm dropping at least 30 on this guy. <laughs> and, um, and he was uh, one of those guys that, he was just like chippy, like he would throw an elbow, kind of like push me. And so it just kept driving my energy all game long. So like, I mean, I'm just like, I'm not, this will sound so prideful, I'm sorry. I'm really not trying to be this, but I was just killing this guy. I mean, just scoring at will on this guy, okay? At one point, our team was up 52 points on this other team. I purposely called a timeout, and in the timeout was yelling, we're not stopping. We're going to take this to the next level. I mean, I'm making sure that this guy and this team hears every, I mean, everybody in the gym knew exactly what I was saying. And so um, we get to, like, kind of the end of the game, and I mean, like, I'm relentless. I'm not stopping. And I go up for this layup, and I'll never forget, I watched him purposely duck down and roll into me and take my legs out. And my legs are up in the air. I come like down, like on, like, I mean, I could have like literally been like paralyzed. I mean, like I came down on my shoulders and my neck. And all all I can say is this, the next thing I remember is that I don't remember anything, if you, you know what I mean, okay? It was like one of those moments that my brain just went red. And I like, I'm like, I can't even say the words because they're horrible words, right? I mean, I'm like going at this guy. Like, I am going to murder this guy. And before I could even get to the guy, my brother, my brother who had just spent three years in Iraq has him by the throat (laughs) against the wall. And he's telling him he's going to rip his throat out. And I'm like, Johnny, we're not ripping his throat out. Like, Like, all right, calm down, you know? And so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about that time of my life, and I was thinking about how at that time of my life, basketball was really a huge part of my identity. Like, these leagues, (laughs) that really meant nothing. I mean, I treated them like they were the NBA finals, okay? I promise you, like... I'm I'm winning these things. These leagues that really meant nothing honestly meant everything to me. And I was thinking about why did that mean so much to me in that time of my life? And the truth was that my main identity of how I saw myself really came from my soul. See, 1 Thessalonians, we've been, we've been hitting this over and over, and the Lord just keeps bringing me back and back, bringing our church back to this verse, okay? It says this, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. Don't you know that that's a journey, though? That's a process. 
that you are being made holy, that you be made holy in every way, that your whole spirit, soul, body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back again. So he's telling us that you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. And for most of us, Our identity, really the true self, the way we truly see ourselves, doesn't come from our spirit. It really comes from where? It comes from our soul. See, we think our identity forms out of things like our body. Our body, you know, when you woke up this morning, your body was craving things, you know? Your body was telling you you're hungry. Your body was telling you things. We think our identity comes from places like our soul, you know? But how many of you know that our soul, unlike our spirit, is broken? See, we grew up with a bunch of um, different moments in our life from our childhood through middle school and college and work moments and all these moments are compiling this information in our soul of who we are and how we see ourselves. But how many of you know that a lot of those moments came out of brokenness, right? And a lot of those moments, can I even go on as far as to say this, a lot of those moments came out of other people's brokenness, that they're projecting their brokenness onto you, but you didn't know that they were broken, so you just felt super broken because they were pouring it out on you, and you didn't even know what was going on in their life. You didn't know what was going on in the behind the scenes of their soul, right? And so we think the true self, right, the true self of us comes out of our soul, and that time in my 20s, My soul was telling me, I mean, as dumb as it sounds, it was telling me, like, be the best basketball player in Kalamazoo. (laughs) I know we laugh at it now, but this is a real thing in my 20s. I'm like 26 year old, and I'm thinking, my, 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 my passion is to be the best player in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Kalamazoo, come on. We got some Kalamazoo people in the house today. I'm super excited. And it sounds dumb and it sounds funny, but that's my story. But here's what the truth is. You have your story of that, right? You have your things that you're trying to live out through the brokenness of your soul. See, if I lost, okay, if I lost a game, I remember it would take me days. I would think over and over again about every mistake that I made on the basketball court for days after days after days. And my identity would be broken that week. If I won, it was a good week, right? Good week. And I would see myself as a victor. I would see myself as I was great. I would see myself through the lens that I won. So Jesus now in Matthew 13, let's jump into Matthew 13. Jesus starts dealing, okay, with our soul in in a different way. I wanna show you this, okay? Because here's the deal. How you will change your world, and and we're gonna talk about that today because I think this idea, we have this idea in church, like, go change the world. And we all think like, how? Can I be honest? We look at the world and we're like, it's so big, it's so broken, it's so messy. How am I supposed to change the world? And and I wanna change that perspective for you today to a something that that is doable. You're gonna change your world. And we're gonna talk about what that looks like because Jesus wants you to change your world, but that's dependent upon your identity in Jesus if you're gonna change your world. So Matthew chapter 13, verse three, says this. He taught them many things by using stories and parables, illustrations of spiritual truth. Jesus said this, consider this, there was a farmer who went out to sow seed, okay? A farmer who went out to sow seed. So I wanna break down this verse for a second, okay? The word here, 
seed, okay, we look at it from the idea of like planting seed, like God is planting little seeds. How many of you grow vegetables or, you know, grow, you know, things good for you, by the way, okay, God bless you, okay. <laughs> My neighbor yesterday, he, Tom, sweet, sweet man, older gentleman, he, he showed me all of his, all of his uh, plants yesterday. He told me all about them, and I was like, Tom, you are just so sweet, okay? No wonder these, no wonder these plants are growing so big right now, okay? So we think, we think about seeds. I want to give you the correct perspective here of what Jesus was actually talking about. He's saying this, the farmer is sowing. What is he sowing? He's sowing people. He's sowing people. Who's he sowing? Us, okay? He said, I'm sowing people into my kingdom, right? So the farmer, who's the farmer? It's God the Father, He sows people into the kingdom of God who do what? Believe in the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace, right? So we believe in Jesus. We believe in his grace. We believe in his goodness. And the Lord sows us, where? He sows us into the world, into our world, right? The farmer sends us throughout the earth. And and this is what happens. When the reality of Jesus comes alive in you and I, we then can do what? Give it. But for so many of us, the reality of Jesus isn't the dominant force. For so many of us, the reality in our heart is what? Is our soul. What's happening in our soul? The brokenness in our soul, the trauma in our soul, the mistakes that we've had, the disappointments that we've had, the moments that life didn't work out, the moments that things didn't happen the way we thought. We have all that happening in our soul. And so instead of giving the kingdom, what are we giving? We're giving that. We're sowing that. This is why I believe in this class so much. Okay? And I know, I can just feel the Lord on this. I know this doesn't look cool. You know what I mean? Like Pastor Jeff held, held up a binder on stage today. It was so cool. It said discipleship class on it. I know it doesn't look cool. But it is chock full of identity. It is so full of the identity that we need for our life. And this is why I believe in this. And this is why I'm so thankful for this. And this is why Nate and Mindy, uh, Nate and Mindy are doing childcare for us. And I'm so thankful that Nate and Mindy stepped up to do childcare so that you could take your kids and have childcare and that you could do what? You could come to a class and you could learn who am I? Who truly am I? See, if you can write this down, I want you to write this down. As the reality of Jesus grows in you, it will touch everything around you. As the reality of the kingdom grows in you, it'll touch everything around you. What does that mean? It means this, that your interactions with your spouse will change. Your interactions with your spouse will become full of grace and peace and joy. It means this, that your interactions with your children will become purposeful. Could you imagine having purposeful conversations with your kids instead of just, I'm just trying to correct them all the time. I'm just trying to keep the peace all the time. You start seeing your children as seed that the Lord wants to sow into the kingdom of God. You see your family in a different way, you see you as a unit. I, I love this. David Aduma, he came on, he came on uh, the other night. We have this uh, growth track class. 
and they came in to take the growth track class because they want to serve. And they came in the other night and they had all their kids. And I said, hey, um, are, are all the kids uh, going to be taking this class? He said, yeah. He goes, we want to serve as a family. Yeah. Amen. Because you start seeing things differently. It affects things like, um, it changes things like family members, your relationship with family members. It changes things like your relationship with your neighbor. I'm so thankful for my relationship with my neighbor, Tom. Um, yesterday, me and Tom, we have this like little pond thing in the back and it got clogged up and me and him were out there with like, uh, I don't know, like sticks and, and, and rakes and we're trying to make it flow right and, and we're working together and, and, uh, and Tom just, uh, we had a moment, we were taking a break and Tom just had this little moment with me. He said, hey, um, I wanna let you know that because of our conversations about Jesus, I've decided to go back to church. I started going back to church again. Come and I was like, Tom, that's incredible. The Lord's given me a moment that he came to, to me a few months ago. His foot was sprained, and I said, you know, the Lord can heal that. And I said, can I just pray with you? And we just prayed together. And a couple days later, he said, he goes, he goes, oh, my gosh, my foot feels better. I'm like, yeah, it's God's love. It's God's goodness. Listen, when the reality of the kingdom, the reality of Jesus grows in you, it affects everything around you. Amen? Romans chapter 8 Verse one, it says, so now there is no condemnation. Aren't you thankful for that? Yes. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. See, so many of us are working out of a broken soul. And many times in the broken soul, what is there? There's guilt and shame. I promise you the number one thing, I, this happened just this week. Uh, I was at a youth camp, and we had the opportunity to pray for kids uh, at the end of Thursday night, and I got an opportunity to pray for two middle school boys, and they're not friends, they didn't talk, just two different circumstances, and both of them came to me. I said, hey, what do you need prayer for? And they just, you could just see the guilt and shame on them. Guilt and shame has a posture. You know what it looks like? They don't, people don't look at you in the eyes. You can see it on them. And instantly the Holy Spirit said, guilt and shame. I said, I, I said are you dealing with some guilt and shame? And they said, yeah, I, I've made some bad choices. And I said, well, thank God that we have a great God who takes that sin and takes that guilt and takes that shame. And as soon as you start speaking the word of God, you can see it's like, it's just like the heaviness flows off of them. But for so many of us, we're working out of our soul, right? That's full of guilt and shame and not working out of what? Our spirit. Because what does the word declare about your spirit? Because remember, your spirit, your soul, and your body. What does the word say about your spirit? You're forgiven. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no condemnation. None whatsoever. Can you imagine? I want you to think about this for a second. Can you imagine living out of your spirit instead of living out of your soul in your, in your interactions with people? Because here, here's what I'm gonna tell you. If you feel guilt and shame all the time, what do you think you're gonna give other people all the time? You're gonna give them guilt and shame. But when you live out of the reality of the kingdom of God, it changes things. This is why Galatians chapter five, verse 22 says this. But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit comes in your life to quicken your spirit, to remind you of who you are. It says this is what it produces in your life. Joy that overflows. Can I get an amen from anybody? Real joy. It says peace that subdues. Subdues what? Craziness. Can I speak to all the moms in the house? You can bring peace into your house in the midst of craziness and crazy seasons with your kids. A, a few months ago, me and Pastor Adesha were talking about some of the kids' rooms, 
And then was, they were just like crazy. It was just craziness. Like somebody like, you know, dropped an elbow on another kid. And you know what I mean? Like, like I, I heard that like one kid took a chair and threw it across the room, you know, and, and we were talking about this. And, and I was just asking the Lord, well, Lord, what do we do about this? He said, go declare my peace in the rooms. Amen. I just went room by room. Yeah. Release the peace of God. You can release the peace of God. It's through the spirit. It says patience that endures. Endures what? Hard times. You know, sometimes you're gonna have to have patience to go through some things. Kindness in action, a life of virtue, faith that prevails, faith that believes, faith that sees, gentleness of heart, strength of spirit. See, when the kingdom, when the realities of these things come alive, all of a sudden we start identifying more with what? Our spirit than our soul. The world doesn't need our soul. The world needs our spirit. All right, back to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse four, it says this. As he casts the seed, what does that mean? As he casts people into the world, into your world, some fell along the beaten path and the birds came and ate them. Others fell along the gravel and it had no topsoil. They quickly sprouted up, but when the days grew hot and it scorched, and withered because it had insufficient roots. Verse seven, others fell along the thorns, so when it sprouted, the thorns choked them out. Verse eight, but here's the verse I wanna get to. Verse eight, but some of the seed fell on the good soil. Good soil, rich soil, that kept producing what? A harvest, yielding 30, 60, even a hundred times as much as it had been planted. Okay, I'm gonna have three points here really quick. Point number one is this, the heart of Jesus, okay? The heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus, Jesus wants our lives to bless other people's lives. Can I get an amen from anybody? He wants you blessed to be a blessing. He wants you, you are the reality of the kingdom to the people around you. Like, I'm not going to work with you tomorrow. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? But you are. And whatever reality of the kingdom that's in you is going to be on display for them. Right? We want people to know Jesus. Let's release the kingdom. He wants you to be a blessing to others. I was reminded of this at camp. Um, do we have that picture? Yeah, awesome, okay? Um, I actually got the opportunity to speak at a, a youth camp in Michigan, the church I used to work for for almost 10 years. And uh, it was so cool because these are all ex-students of ours that are just doing incredible things for God. This is, his name is Amik. I remember when I first met Amik, he, he came up to me, he had hair in his eyes, and I was like, what's your name? He's like, Amik. And I was like, what? Amik. I was like, what? He, I was like, okay, we'll, we'll figure out your name later, okay? You know, he was so shy. He was so um, insecure. He's now the worship leader of that church. This is, uh, this is Aaron. Um, he was just a squirrely young man in our youth group. We have Annie, and we have Jordan, and Mahin, and we have Matt. And I was reminded at camp of sowing seeds. And, and, I, and, and here's, what, here's what I was reminded of. This is what I was reminded of. All of them, all of them love the Lord. All of them have families that love the Lord. All of them have children who love the Lord. All of them are using their gifts and their talent and their treasure to push the kingdom of God forward. All of them. And where did it start? It started with squirrely little middle schoolers, right? Yeah. Right, so I mean, okay, can, let's just be real for a second. We like, we're like, yay, Pastor Adam, come on, the youth group, right? And we don't think anything more of it. But do you know that there's world changers in the youth group right now, right? And the Lord reminded me, 
What, what, did, what did I do? What did I sow into these kids? The reality of the kingdom that was happening in my heart at that time. We had this youth group called In Fuego. Everybody's like, why'd you call it In Fuego? I was like, I don't know. I like the name. They said it on ESPN all the time. <laughs> it was cool. It meant fire. I liked it. And I just sowed, I just sowed my heart into them. And then what happens? 30, 60, 100 times more. Yeah, and then, and let, and then kids, look, look. Th- this family, this family, she was at the, at the camp. She wanted to come to our church so badly that they drove from Michigan to be here today. Yeah. Come on. How, I mean, like, look. I want to. I want to tell you. You don't know what you're doing in somebody's life. You don't know how you're changing somebody's life. You don't know how you're changing generations and futures. And that's one of the most exciting things to think about when I get to heaven. To think about, oh my gosh, I didn't know that it produced thirty, sixty, a hundred times. I was just releasing the kingdom. We're just releasing. The kingdom. Point number two is this. We only give what we have. We only give what we have. So many of us grew up in broken homes, broken situations, and even for those who grew up in what we would consider a normal home, so many of you grew up with moms or dads that had brokenness in their own soul, and and so what, what do they do? They project their brokenness onto you. You know, so many of us grew up in, you know, homes that they were really hard and they were really tough and they were really strict. And we grew up in homes that was always about performance driven, right? And so then we grow up thinking that, that how we see ourselves is based upon our performance. Can I get an amen from anybody? Right? We think that the way that God sees us is based upon our performance, Like I had a good week, I had a bad week. Why? Because we grew up in homes where there was brokenness and and souls of parents and then they poured it on us and then what happens? It just repeats. You wanna know what a generational curse is? It's just issues in people's souls that go from generation to generation to generation to generation. But how many of you know that God wants to break the generational curses in your life so that it doesn't go to the next generation? There was a generational curse of divorce in my family. Five generations deep. We're a couple weeks, 22 years. No, 22, 22. You're wrong. How am I right? How do you not have this right? What does God want to do? He wants to break it. But here's what I know. You can't give what you don't know. You can't give what you don't have. I'm going to come back to this. If, if you don't know what God says about you, how are you supposed to give it? And that's not judgment. Please hear me. Because I feel like growing up in church, I just felt like I was judged all the time. I'm not judging you. I promise you. I want you to come to know who you are in Jesus. That's why we're doing this. This is why we're doing this. This is why, listen, we all have things that we could be doing on a Wednesday night. But this is important. We feel, I'm gonna be really honest with you, we feel like this is a mandate on our church. I feel like we have been we have been praying and seeking the Lord on this, and the Lord just keeps showing us that through the course of this church, there's going to be thousands that will take these classes. And then guess what? They'll get planted into their world. They'll get planted into their family, into their kids, into their coworkers. And guess what? The kingdom spreads. Can I just tell you? The kingdom isn't this room, (laughs) right? We all think that the kingdom is this room and and what happens in this room 
is, is the kingdom. No, the kingdom is in you. And you're called to take the kingdom out of this room. This is just a rallying point. This is just a moment that we encourage you, we strengthen you, the presence comes, God heals, he restores. This is not the end all be all. This is just one day. Then you take the kingdom out with you, amen? You gotta have God's truth. You gotta have God's kindness. You gotta have God's goodness in you. Point number three is this. Receive it for yourself. Receive it for yourself. I want to tell you something today. I want you to write this down. God's not withholding grace and forgiveness from you. So many times we beat ourselves up. We beat ourselves up on the altar of the Lord. And we don't receive the very thing that God paid for. I want you, if you can, write this down. When you hold condemnation and guilt instead of giving it to Jesus, you're doing God's job instead of God doing his job. Thank you. You're doing God's job. You think that beating yourself up, you think that you thinking that, you know, you are just the worst and you're a worm and and, and all of these, all these tragic thoughts, you think that you are making yourself holy. You're not making yourself holy. Only the Lord can make you holy. And he has made you holy. Amen? You gotta receive it for yourself. Write this down. Whatever you hold, Jesus can't. Whatever you're holding today, whatever insecurities in your soul, whatever fear in your soul, whatever is going on in your soul that you are holding on to, guess what? That means that Jesus can't hold on to it. Either you hold it or he holds it. And he wants to hold it. He wants to carry it. Do you know that verse that I read this morning? And I get it. I'm not perfect at this. I'm telling you right now, I'm not perfect at this. But he goes, Give me your weariness. Give me your burdens. Give me your heavy laden. Give me all of these emotions. Let him go. Can I just challenge you with something really, really real today? Be honest with God. He can take it. He can take it. If you're angry in life, if you're frustrated, if you're disappointed, if you're overwhelmed, give it to him. He's big enough. He can carry it. He can hold it. Write this down. Forgive yourself and let go. (laughs) Sometimes you gotta forgive yourself. Sometimes you're like, I know God's forgiven me, but I haven't forgiven myself. See, when the reality of the kingdom comes alive in you, you realize, oh, he came to set me free. (laughs) Can I get an amen? Come on, I should have got amen there. Isn't freedom the goal? That we live in the freedom of God? We live in his goodness, we live in his love? But the enemy will come with his condemnation, his guilt, reminding you of the past, reminding you of the past, reminding you of the past, reminding you of the past. And what happens? You can't forgive yourself. The Lord's forgiven you, but you can't forgive yourself. Or he'll remind you of broken trauma in your heart. He'll remind you of broken things in in your past. See, the enemy is trying to keep you bound. Bound where? In your soul so that your true identity never comes out of what? Your spirit. Amen? Like God wants you to go into your world this week and go, all right, I have a joy that does not come from this world. You could feel it in worship today, couldn't you? There was a joy in the room. There was a grace in the room. 
And the Lord goes, I want you to operate from that place this week. I want you to operate from that place that you have patience this week. I want you to operate from that place that you have peace this week. I want you to operate from that place that you know, hey, I'm facing some stuff, but another one's on the way. My faith is in the one that's greater. My faith is in the one that is stronger. My faith is in the one who is faithful. My faith is in the one who doesn't fail. My faith is in the one that hasn't given up on me. My faith is in the one. My faith's not in this world. My faith is in the one. He's got me. Then you can release the kingdom. And guess what? The kingdom's attractive. The Lord told me this the other day. Uh, I was teaching growth crack, and he just said, people are attracted to passion and joy and love and grace. It's attractive. You know why? Because it's the aroma of heaven. It's what's happening in heaven today. There's joy. There's peace. There's grace, there's love. And when that is on your life, it attracts others to go, where did you get this? Where can I find this? Can you help me? Can you pray for me? I um, I wanna do this. I want everybody to have something, a phone, anything. You can write something down, okay? And this is what I want us, we're gonna ask the Lord this question. I want you to ask the Lord, who do you want me to believe for? Everything is so self-focused. Everything is always on us, but we're called to be seed to the earth, to others. So I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, who in my life needs to hear the gospel? Who in my life needs a reality of the kingdom of God? God, who in my life needs me to pray for them? God, who in my life needs to experience the love and the goodness of God through my life? God, who do you want me to pray for? Who do you want me to believe for? Who do you want me to stand in faith for? Who do you want me to take the kingdom to? Let God show you. Let God show you. God, let God show your words. Let God show your love. Let God show who you are to show this broken world. Hey, there's so much more. Amen? There's so much more. We're gonna start doing something really, really cool at our church in a couple weeks. We're gonna start having pre-service prayer on Sunday mornings at 9.30. Amen. Come on. And the purpose of that is to pray for these people. Right? To pray that that when you engage with them, they receive the kingdom. To pray that when they come into our house, they receive the kingdom. Amen? Amen. I want us to start getting our eyes off of us all the time and getting our eyes on others. There are people that you are connected to that need Jesus. They need God. They need his love. They need you. They need this church. And guess what? You're the bridge. Your life is the bridge to take them over. Amen? Would you stand up this morning?